We're right in the range for iron. I thought we were high. But it says 40 to 200, and we don't have anything over 100. Well, look, look, at, look at your total test. It's the next page. That tells you how much iron is really there. Okay, yeah, it's what, yeah. It says 22. Um, oh no, it doesn't even say what the things are. So, so yeah, we're like 40, 40,945, 40,736. The lowest is the garden here, and that's 22,447. So are all those pretty high? Yeah, well, they're not high for iron. Uh -huh. it's, it's common. See what happens in the clay soil is the aluminum bonds with the silica mm -hmm. and that's what makes it clay mm -hmm. but that clay is an aggregate so even though it's a very tiny particle it has billions of atoms to make up that particle yeah. 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 now those billions of atoms of aluminum silicate are attracting cations the very first cation they attract is iron so all of the inner like layers of cations that that accumulate around that uh, clay particle the innermost layers will be iron and second to the iron is magnesium that's the red clay and so you get the red clay and it's real rich in iron and real rich in magnesium if you look at the total test. Yeah. Our soils are all like that. I can't ever believe that the extension recommends dolomitic lime. It's like, why in the world would you recommend dolomitic lime? Because yeah. it's cheaper, that's the only reason. Uh -huh. And it has more neutralizing Capacity. capability uh -huh. because a magnesium atom will neutralize two units of charge because it's a plus two cation and a calcium ion neutralizes the same but the magnesium ion only weighs 24 atomic weight units whereas the calcium weighs 40. the calcium's way heavier for the same amount of change it makes in the ph do you agree with Elaine Ingham that the um, pH is way less important if you have the life right? Yeah, it's way less important if you have your balance of the minerals right, too. Because if you neutralized, you could take, you could take sodium hydroxide and neutralize any of the acids in your soil. And you'd have so much sodium in there that nothing else would grow. So, the balance of cations is the important thing. Mm -hmm. And if you were on a light sandy soil like down in Florida, mm -hmm. man, you, you don't have any magnesium or any calcium in right. your soil. Right. You need them both. Mm -hmm. So dolomite lime is the lime of choice there. Yeah. 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 But these heavy clays here in North Carolina is a different thing entirely. You're quite right. They should never never be recommending dolomite for these soils yeah. you have to work really hard to get high calorie. yeah but you should yeah, you should expensive. you should see the what they teach though because they teach that lime is to raise the ph and that's not what lime needs to do lime needs to store the needed cations in the cation exchange if you don't build the cations you need in there, then you'll be building something else that you don't need in there, and it'll get in the way. Magnesium is, it has so much attractive power because it's a small atom, but if it were to give up its two electrons and ionize as a plus two ion, it's giving up one-sixth of its charge because it only has 12 electrons and two of them is, is half of 12. That's a sixth of its charge. If calcium, which has 20 electrons, if it gives up two electrons, that's only a tenth of its charge. 
So it can, it can give up those two electrons, it can separate, the soil can crumble with calcium, whereas it'll stick like, you know, like glue to your shoes if it's a magnesium. Because the same electronic attraction on a much smaller cation, and man, it's just, it makes it sticky. We're not used to, to realizing what's going on with electricity the way we do with gravity or magnetism. We know that the solar system is experiencing those gravitational forces. The whole system, you know, we know that the moon's gravity and the sun, Earth's gravity are interacting and there's a place where it's neutral up there in between the sun and the earth. The moon and the earth are the sun. But yeah, on one side of that you'd fall into the moon, the other side you fall to the earth. Interesting. We know too that the earth's magnetic field is the whole earth and the solar system has a magnetic field too and the galaxy has a magnetic field and it's like it's a large scale thing. We don't realize that there's an electric field to the universe. We see electricity in its most, you know, immediate application. And we think it's something strictly local. But it's not. And what really, really shows you this is nitrogen. Nitrogen is the first anion in the periodic table. It's the first negatively charged element and it's a triple negative anion. So there's nothing so sensitive to the electron flux of the universe as nitrogen. Nitrogen just really is tuned into all the electron activity all the way out to the furthest stars. So nitrogen is the basis of our thought and perception, uh, the, the electrical activity that allows the brain to be the transducer between the spirit and the body. That, you know, that's nitrogen that we're, that we're working with. Nitrogen is a really, really, really sensitive element that does amazing, amazing things. And you think we should always be aiming for nitrate as the source for plants? No, just the opposite. We should always be doing our best to limit the nitrates and to ensure that we maximize our amino acid uptake rather than our salt nitrogen uptake because this the nitrogen as nitrate is dead nitrogen it's free nitrogen mm -hmm. it's not it, it it isn't held down anymore mm -hmm. it's not bound in anything that's a uh, carbon structure so so basically you want the plants feeding off the dead microbes <coughs> Yeah, you want to see the protozoa in the soil as they excrete amino acids that the plant picks it up. So you've got to get your fungi, your bacteria, and your protozoa all working in a balanced and cohesive way. And then the plant takes up its nitrogen as amino acids and it's just assembling its proteins and it develops the fullest of its genetic potential that way. And so the EM helps with that because it's... Because the EM contains microbes that scavenge the nitrates. Mm -hmm. So what you have out here is you've got bacteria and various things in the soil. And when it dries up, they become like raisins or tea leaves or whatever. And then when the soil gets saturated again, their protoplasm goes into solution. So now it's no longer held within the organism. 
it's free. And when it's free like that, the amino acids oxidize and you end up with nitrates. The EM will hold that process back. And there's a biodynamic preparation, the oak bark preparation, which does this. And if we're brewing EMs, we should brew them with the oak bark preparation because it will ensure that it has that kind of activity when you put it on your field. So that's, I'm always trying to convince the guys, and I don't do it enough myself, to ensure that we don't let fallow beds and greenhouses dry out. I think that's a huge mistake. Do you agree? It's, a, it's a huge mistake because then when you hydrate them again, all of that protoplasm goes into solution, oxidizes, and you've got nitrates. I think that's how we wreck the fertility in that greenhouse. Yeah. And you can... You and I knew can, better, I just didn't stay on it, you know? And you can avoid a lot of that by using EM. We cured Tully in far north Queensland has seven meter annual rainfall. Try seven to... Meter. Yes, yeah, seven meters. That's 39 inches to the meter. So if you multiplied seven times 40, you'd have 280 inches of rain. Wow. Deduct seven from that and you have 273 inches of rain. Divide that by 36. No, divide it by 12 to see how many feet of rain that is in a year, in a year. You don't get it all in one month, but you get it, most all of it, you get it in January, February, and March, which can easily rain more than a meter in each of those three months. This is when, if your banana plantation is too close to the Ubanangi Marsh, you don't go out in your bananas because yeah, crocodiles will eat you. Ouch. <laughs> you got it in one, crocodiles, and you know. <laughs> Look, these things, these things are like, alligators are, are little wimpy things. Uh, yeah, you're talking about 18 to 20 feet, you know, or more. These crocodiles are big. No, no, they 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 give guns a little respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not looking to pick a fight with humans, because mm -hmm. they lose. They know. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> but if you're out there, without if a gun, you're that's right. If you're alone by the riverbank, yeah. then uh, you could. Now the crocodile will snap and grab you, and then roll. Yeah. And, and yeah, break your bones all up, knock you unconscious and everything, stuff you under some tree roots and soften you up and have a meal at, at leisure. Mm -hmm. Meals, multiple. Mm -hmm. They'll eat you in stages. Mm -hmm. But you won't know any different because, yeah, yeah. That first roll, <laughs> that first roll does it. <laughs> done, yeah, snap neck, done, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah, oh man, they're, yeah. they're so quick. Right, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now they're a scary proposition, but they're pretty amazing. They, they sure their are. Place. Yeah. yeah. Well, should we go look at the garden in the greenhouse here before we? Yeah. Then I'll try and call those guys and see if they sent those results in.